Good afternoon, it's Tuesday the 19th of July 2016, just after one o'clock and welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host Brian Gerrish with me in the studio, Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Great to be with you, Brian. Well, can I say you're looking very hot, very dapper, that's <laughs> the English expression. And of course, heat is the big issue today because in Plymouth, um, local authority is so concerned children have been told to keep out of the sun over the midday heat. So this is the new level of fear. Apparently when the sun comes out, adults in UK are no longer able to make a judgment on uh, what children should do or indeed what they should do uh, because they're being given guidance on surviving these excessively hot temperatures. Yeah, they're calling it it's an extreme weather warning. Parents have been uh, notified of extreme weather and that right. uh, the children must stay indoors between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Uh, Protect them. Stay safe. Protect them from the sun. Right. And the blue sky. Okay. Well, we don't know what the advice is in Norfolk, and we've had a report that it's up to 32 degrees there. Of course, all of this is utter nonsense because people have been surviving sunshine for thousands of years. And I believe the temperature in Arizona, probably about 120 today. In the shade. In the shade, but people will still be living. Great, isn't it? Uh, we'll also be joined today by Alex Thompson from Eastern Approaches, who'll be with us via live Skype link from Holland. Well, first of all, as predicted uh, by the UK column, of course, the whole of the Brexit agenda was a PSYOP. And let's have a look at this headline, which starts to set the scene, uh, because we've apparently got the first court case now to stop Brexit. It's reached the High Court. Uh, and apparently MPs must vote before UK quits the European Union. So interesting case. We'll bring in a couple of images over the top of this in a minute. Uh, but we've got a London hairdresser, uh, Dia Dos Santos. So um, British citizen, we don't know. That's an interesting question. Uh, but basically, um, he's already been able to get this um, very high profile case into the high courts. Now, who do you think, Patrick, would be a good person to sit in judgment? Well, if I was wanting to get this uh, looked after properly, we need a safe pair of hands, Brian. Right. Whoever's going to be in charge of judging this needs to be a safe pair of hands. So who, who could that be? Um, well, I'm going to guess at, uh, I'm going to guess at Mr. Leveson. So let's bring him in, the man who uh, was working very hard to get control of the British press and media, um, is the very same man who is now going to be in control of the puppet show, which is Brexit. And he's going to be joined by another judge, Justice Cranson. Uh, this man is very interesting because he's a Labourite, um, absolutely Labour man, Tony Blair man through and through. Uh, but apparently uh, these men are going to be deciding what our MPs should do. And in the meantime, of course, nobody wants to take any notice of the majority of uh, Britons who voted for leave. Well, if you want to get further into this case, uh, it's probably good to go, go and have a look at Edwin Co. This is the law firm that is employing Dominic Chambers QC, and uh, they're going to be taking, the, taking this battle through the High Court. Now, we get another fantastic clue as to what's really going on here, because um, a few minutes ago, uh, the Guardian reported that Theresa May has said, relax, we're not going to trigger Article 50 this year. And in this article, uh, Theresa May is apparently saying, well, she thinks that challenges to Brexit are going to go to the Supreme Court. So we haven't even followed through the High Court procedure, but she's pretty confident. Do you think that's Mr. Leveson? She's pretty confident it's going to go to the Supreme Court. So as Mike Robinson would be saying, were he here, this is the start of the delay, 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 um, whilst they do nothing and continue those uh, trade agreements. Once this goes into uh, lower and then the higher courts, you're talking about maybe 18 months? Years. Uh, years, perhaps. So uh, no exiting the EU, Brian. No. Not for, not for at least uh, three years? Five, or more. five years? Or more. Or more. Ten years? while the whole process goes on behind closed doors. 
And as you mentioned before we came uh, on air, of course, nothing to be seen of Nigel Farage now. No, this is where you would expect him to be front and center at the center of the discussion, kicking and screaming, waving the flag, doing all the for things. For the people who voted leave. For all these people who voted uh, to leave. So where is Nigel? On Farage? holiday. He's on vacation. Yes, apparently he's been a little bit fearful. He's got a bit tough, so he's got on holiday. So as uh, the UK column has predicted, Nigel Farage has waved the banner, led the UKIP voters in particular into the cul-de-sac, and then simply gone on holiday. With a red flag. El Toro. A little bit of bullfighting. Yeah. Well, Alex, perhaps we should just bring you in here. What's your opinion on uh, what Theresa May has said? Well, Brian, I think it means uh, quite clearly that she has no intention of invoking royal prerogative, at least not until the courts have told her that she can, because at least uh, in, in the law of England and Wales, and here's one of the com complications, uh, are we going to, is the UK going to leave under the law of England and Wales or under the superstructure called UK law, which quickly feeds into treaty law? That's a question we need to get sorted out. But under the law of England and Wales, um, the, it's quite clear that the Prime Minister uh, or any uh, minister of the Crown has royal prerogative, which in the end is acting in the name of the people under the mandate that the people have given them. So we've got a Crown that won't step in and say this is the will of the people. Uh, and we've got it all being siphoned off to the route of judicial review, which is the procedure that Mr Dos Santos is going, going for. Judicial review is another can of worms. In Scotland, it's taken the place of a second chamber because Holyrood is a unicameral legislature with no equivalent of the House of Lords or Senate to put a break on anything that MSPs wish to do. So judicial review is very much being ramped up uh, to the position of a continental legislature. And perhaps this is the way to do the same in England and Wales, is to say, hang the House of Lords and hang checks and balances. Uh, appointed judges will, as in the Napoleonic model, always take precedence over the elected members of Parliament, <clears throat> which is a rather difficult situation, uh, because, as I've been saying, we, knew, we, we, we definitely need uh, 650 independent MPs uh, elected on a clear manifesto of repealing the article, sorry, the, the um, 1972 European Communities Act, otherwise it will never happen. Uh, MPs who will stand up and say, forget royal prerogative and forget the courts, we're the people and we're sovereign. Uh, but now we, we have this psychological confusion uh, based on the idea that judicial review and Lord Justice Leveson uh, can slap down uh, what the people have wished to implement. So we're going to go around in circles for ages, really. Um, treaty law, international law, it's worthy in its way, but it just goes round in circles. Who has the power to do what? We never know. Uh, we have, as, as one of the jurisprudentialist experts of the, of the last century has said, we, we uh, always see that sovereignty is um, ultimately exercised uh, by actually invoking it. In other words, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If the British people wish to show their sovereignty, they require to get rid of their current crop of MPs, um, ideally by recall, but certainly in general elections, and uh, appoint men to Parliament who are actually going to do what they say. Otherwise, we're going to go around like this and the fish is going to eat its tail for decades. Uh, well, thoroughly agree with that, Alex. Well, uh, towards the end of the news, we're going to be talking about Mr Chilcott, and that leads us back into the subject of the law and where the law stands in this country. Uh, but as you say, the minimum is we can see that the agenda is, is to take the whole thing round in circles. Now, before we move on to the subject of Turkey, which I, I know that, uh, Patrick, you're very keen to get back onto that, and Alex is going to provide some in-depth analysis, I just wanted to say that a couple of comments have come in, um, which is accusing me of UKIP bashing. Now, I find this very interesting because, actually, uh, the UK column has, in general, been very supportive of UKIP and actions to fight the European Union. However, what we have consistently said is that Nigel Farage would betray uh, UKIP as a party and the UKIP followers by leading people into a cul-de-sac. And that is exactly what he has done. And as you've just said, Patrick, at the call cool moment when he should be there to lead uh, the Leave uh, membership, certainly to, to lead the UKIP uh, people who have fought so hard for this situation, he has simply abandoned the party and walked away. So I would just like to say to those people that um, haven't uh, worked out the subtlety of our message, please have a think again as to the difference between comments relating to Mr Nigel Farage and comments which are about UKIP. 
Well, maybe we'll be talking more about that in due course. But, but just one comment to that. Sorry. The, the point of that is, Brian, when the vote happened, when the referendum happened and the result was had, that, that is not the end of, of the campaign or the it's effort. The start. That's the start. So uh, where is the party leadership? Where is the UK party itself? Where is the who's, uh, UK, UKIP leadership? Where are they? Not just Farage, but the, the party leadership. This is when they should be pushing hard for the last six weeks, and it's been invisible, yep. non-existent. It's as if it evaporated and disappeared. And this is absolutely the wrong time to disappear. And we said this on this show many times before the vote, during, and in the aftermath. So this isn't anything new that we're saying here, but it's, it seems to me common sense is this is when, it's, this is the yeah. crucial time if you really want to implement the, the, the mandate that the people have uh, laid down with that referendum. And that's not happening. No, so. it's not happening because what's he done left UKIP rudderless at a critical time. Alex, I'll just give you a 30 second response on that particular subject if, uh, if you'd like to, and then we'll move on to the subject of Turkey. If you look up um, on YouTube, Nigel Farage 1993, you will see him setting up UKIP when it was still just known as UKIP. It hadn't even got a, a brand name yet as UKIP. And he very correctly says, you can't call us a one issue party because uh, if we're governed from Brussels, then there are no single issues, all our issues are managed from Brussels. And this was before I think he was, was got at or become, became more establishment. He's absolutely right. Uh, and But really that just points to the fact that parties cannot solve our mess. Uh, parliamentary democracy in the Anglo-Saxon model uh, was never designed for parties and for whipping. Uh, and it really has been the, the undoing of our system. We need independent men, as we did at the founding of the United States and through the great age of English and, yes, Scottish parliamentary uh, democracy as well, before and after the Act of Union. So um, forget all the talk of single-issue parties and, and where's the leadership. Uh, we actually need our local representatives to be speaking about what we wish to do. OK, thank you for that. Well, over to you, really, Patrick, and uh, Turkey, where is it going? Well, uh, the immediate aftermath is right now the West uh, throughout the media is condemning Turkey, President Erdogan, for his uh, violent purge after the coup uh, and justice being done in the streets, as we said on this program yesterday. Uh, and also they're threatening him on a number of levels now. Uh, so Turkey's become a sort of enemy uh, overnight of the West after being one of their greatest allies, which is completely incomprehensible, yet this is exactly what we're, we're seeing. So. This, uh, again, what we said yesterday, a, a realignment shift, I think, is taking place. And uh, it's actually been taking place since April, but it hasn't been reported on in the media. It's only this coup that has brought uh, a lot of this to light. We'll review some of these important points right now. Uh, but uh, so Turkey's coup, the Gulan movement explained. Uh, here's an article here, uh, Vox Magazine. Now, I, I want to bring in Alex Thompson right now. Um, Alex, in your opinion, what is the significance of uh, Fethullah Gulen uh, in today's Turkish uh, politics and military affairs. I called him a Trojan horse, uh, an American Trojan horse yesterday. Uh, that's, and I think his, his significance is waning now, especially after this purge, but it's still there. It's still a significant element. It's not, it's not disappeared, uh, but certainly taken a big hit this weekend. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Alec? Gulen is just that. He's the Trojan horse and the Manchurian candidate that uh, America and the West wished to inject into the Turkish body politic. And what we're finding now is that there has been a split in Turkish nationalism or Islamism within Turkey, you might like to call it. And those who are being called Gulenists, who may have been behind this putsch, are still in the mindset of America, West, liberal democracy, secularism, salvation. And those behind Erdogan, who is a very nasty man, I have no hesitation in saying, but those who are behind Erdogan, and particularly the Turkish intelligence uh, side of the picture, as distinct from the police and army, uh, these core men of the Turkish deep state have actually split from Gulen because they've realized what he is. Yeah. And, uh, and right now, uh, the purge is underway. 6,000 people have been arrested, uh, 2,700 judges dismissed. Go trials should begin soon. This is going to be a long, drawn-out process, Alex, or is this something that's going to be taken care of quickly? Uh, it seems to me like Erdogan has a very significant mandate right now. So he, a lot of people saying he can do what he wants right now. He's riding a wave of national hero, heroism, uh, some might describe it. 
These people are Turks, so they're not even akin to Arabs. They have their own very oriental mindset, uh, a very um, communitarian-based philosophy. Um, we can like it or lump it, but they are their own people with their own hazards, surrounded by uh, hostile uh, nations and with a very sen a great sense of the precariousness of their position uh, because of the pivot they're on. Uh, geopolitically as well, at the geographical position. So will it be drawn, drawn out? I suspect it will be short and nasty uh, because the Austrian commissioner of the EU has already uh, correctly pointed out that Mr Erdogan uh, had drawn up these purge lists, uh, the arrest warrants, before the putsch happened. So the putsch was a convenient attempt. I'm not saying Erdogan stoked it, but I think it was highly uh, fortuitous for him that it happened. You've mentioned the, the two and a half thousand judges uh, and so on who were sacked on the first day of the putsch on Friday. Well, that was followed up on, was it Sunday or yesterday, Monday, by the sacking of nigh 8,000 civil servants, all, uh, all but a few of whom were from the Ministry of the Interior, which in these uh, Near Eastern countries really runs the country and the justice system and everything. Um, so that is very significant. Uh, all the people who have been pushed aside are not all radical Gulenists conspiring with America and Israel, which is Erdogan's way of putting it, but they are the kind of unthinking people who haven't realized what uh, Trojan horses are being put into Turkish society. And uh, we also have this article here by Paul Craig Roberts, uh, from his website in the Institute for Political Economy. The headline is, uh, Nice brings to mind Operation Gladio. Now we're, so now we're moving uh, uh, south here. Uh, just comment on this uh, very quickly. The people can easily get this, uh, find this to be too much and too complicated, but just bear in mind the simple terms, Gulen, CIA's man, and Paul Craig Roberts, who was, I think, deputy assistant uh, level in the U.S. Uh, administration under Reagan, a very senior man, do sign up to his, his new letter, newsletters. He is talking about Nice rather than the Turkish putsch, but that also happened last weekend. And what he's saying is it's uh, reminiscent of the first wave of Gladio, the CIA-based um, and the MI6-based plan to get the continental Europeans to set up fake uh, far-left terror organizations to bomb their own people who are in fact far-right nationalists. And the second wave of Gladio, not under the name of Gladio, but uh, what Sibel Edmonds has called Gladio B, was to move this forward to the Turkish nations, Turkey and the other Turkic tribes around them. And the whole point is to drive a wedge between Europe, Russia and China, because the Turks sit between those three power blocks, and uh, through Islamism and, and uh, a kind of nationalism and terrorism, to really <clears throat> destabilize Turkey in its secular uh, state. That's what is at the bottom of all this. Uh, Sibel Edmonds, uh, on her interviews with the Corbett Report, has pointed out that Mr. Fethullah Gulen has been in Pennsylvania since 1999, and next door to him, in another CIA property, is the same elderly man, they're both very elderly now, who is supposed to do the same for the Xinjiang, the, the Turkestan Turks of, of Western China. So basically you've got two men in reserve, one for Turkey and one for China, just waiting to be uh, put in at the right moment, or at least that they continue from Pennsylvania a kind of brand idea which keeps um, the idea uh, live in this belt of countries of, of, having, a ter of uh, having a color revolution. Um, and of course the other side of Gulen is that he runs all these schools all over the West, Turkey, America, everywhere. Uh, what's being taught there, and have a look at, as D Brian keeps saying, David Cameron's big society and uh, new models of schooling. This stuff is being pioneered not just for the Turkic nations or the, the, the Islamic world. This stuff is going to be launched on America and Britain. Yeah, yeah the Gulenist schools are uh, a very potent grant of uh, Salafism uh, previously, but uh, he's got his tentacles in many different areas, uh, a bit of a foundation. And also, nobody knows the exact extent of it because everything is done in very loose networks. So I've seen figures of between 1 million followers and 8 million followers. And I think this is one of the insidious things that it exists. It's real. It's a network. Mm -hmm. It's being controlled, but it's very loose when you try and pin down what it's doing. The same with the Saudi Arabian uh, network of uh, religious education globally and the money, uh, hundreds of millions, in fact, billions of dollars pumped into mosques and some might say installing radical clerics in these mosques as well, uh, worldwide. So this is the same sort of phenomenon we see, with both with a hidden hand behind it, both with an agenda behind it. So the next, uh, we've got an article from the Turkish Sun, and uh, the headline here, uh, Turkey and Syria to normalize relations soon. Now this is a dramatic pivot in Turkish and uh, Levantine relations, as, as the headline says, over the past month, Turkey has normalized relations with Russia, Israel, and has given signals of normalizing relations with Egypt and Syria. The last one is of particular importance, Syria. 
uh, Turkey has been probably the number one facilitator of the Syrian conflict uh, from 2010 when they started uh, hosting uh, radical fighters, allowing them to camp in southern Turkey and then go over the border back and forth. And the Syrian government early on couldn't chase them into Turkey. And this is one of the advantages that helped to kind of foment this conflict, which they called a civil war, which wasn't a civil war from 2011, let's say, properly. But um, Alex, um, this is significant. This was kind of, these noises were being made before the coup, Alex. So a lot of people are pointing to the possibility that the West or elements of the CIA uh, through the Gulenist Trojan horse might have uh, played a significant role in backing this failed coup. And when you see stories like this, Alex, that really does support that theory. What, what are your thoughts on that? Having lived in a neighboring country to Turkey and having followed the whole region for years, including as a civil servant, I, I know that the uh, the parameters are just as you say. Nothing is done uh, spontaneously and immediately. Uh, things are trialed. You know, the, uh, ideas are flown up a flagpole before they um, they are launched. And in this case, you've got a minor party, a kind of ultra-nationalist party, Vatan, meaning fatherland, uh, speaking on behalf of Erdogan, because it's safe to use an extremist to do, or an extreme right wing or whatever to deny the idea. But the plan is Mr. Erdogan wishes to uh, restore relations which were damaged with all of these Levantine Near Eastern countries. Uh, for example, Israel, with whom there was a very good secular anti-Islamist-based um, military relationship for decades, destroyed after the Gaza flotilla incident of 2010. And uh, as the Vatan leader is saying in that article, well, we managed it with Israel. What we did is we said that Bibi Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, had to write a letter of apology for um, the attack on our assets and civilians. And that worked in 2013. And of course, the whole idea is that Erdogan in April um, has, has gone on the same thing by writing to Putin about the downed Russian jet, saying, I'm sorry for the loss of life. I, I uh, offer my sincere apologies to the parents of the of the pilot, just as Netanyahu had done in the, in the Gaza flotilla case. And so we've got, you know, the initiative going from uh, Israel in one case, and now from Turkey in the case of, of Russia, so that Turkey is going really to have restored relations, as it historically did through all its set, set decades of, of secularism, um, with all of these countries, which is going to exclude the US uh, and Israel from being able to uh, drive wedges in the region. And uh, it's going to be much harder to make it plausible that there are radical Islamists running around disrupting things if all the governments in the region are agreed on things. Particularly if you join the UK column as a member and you watch our um, Insight episode on Eurasia, uh, you will see uh, one of the points made there uh, is is just that that towards the end we say uh, Syria is the crucial land because uh, if you if Saudi oil and Qatari gas can be sent through Syria to Europe, then you've you've got no need for, to, keep, to keep Turkey on side and you've got no need for Russian gas. So it's it's a dream really for the Anglo-American elite, and that's at the root of of, of all the current uh, war being fought in in Syria. And Turkey has realised this and. Uh, Normalizing relations with Syria and Lebanon and Israel is a major step towards ending the Syrian war and denying elements in the West the ability to keep stoking it. And let's look at the uh, the knock-on effects of potential instability from the, the Turkish coup in this what you call a very important region, uh, Eurasia, in terms of geopolitics, in terms of NATO policy, in terms of the potential of EU military integration as well. This is the center point of most of NATO's focus right now. So Azerbaijan catches. Uh, Gulen is Trojan horse. So Azerbaijan shuts down TV channel uh, over plans to air a Gulen interview. What is going on here, Alex? This is interesting, especially with some of the reports we've heard in recent days about uh, potential instability in places like Armenia. And uh, just go, go ahead, Alex. Well, what's going on is the, the Westerners, uh, the Western elite planners have overshot again. Uh, they have thought, well, the Gulen idea worked for Turkey, or well, they thought it did. So these Azeris, right, they speak a mutually intelligible language. They're Turkic people too. Surely the Gulen stuff will work on them. Well, no, it don't, doesn't, because the Azeris have got a Soviet history, and they're from a different school of Islam, from uh, from Shia rather than Sunni, much closer to the Iranians. Uh, and so they uh, see that a private TV channel in Azerbaijan is going to interview Gulen and uh, move very quickly to shut down uh, this interview so that the Azeri people never get to, to uh, develop a sympathy for this Mr. Gulen. So they've realized very quickly that if you let Gulen in and, and people start thinking, what a nice old man with some lovely ideas, then it won't be long before some of the same things start happening in Azerbaijan as happened to Turkey. And these areas want to preserve what they have of their uh, oil wealth and their independent uh, uh, attitude towards both Russia and the West. So they, they've moved quickly, really. 
In addition to the Kurds um, as being a really dominant ethnic group and also uh, a bone of uh, political contention for uh, Ankara, for the Turkish government, we also have the Armenian uh, situation, which has long-running shared and bloody history between those two countries. This is also a bone of contention. The West have been trying uh, to play Armenia, in my opinion anyway, uh, a very important, small but very important uh, country. And then you have the territorial dispute between Azerbaijan and Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. So what is happening here? Color revolution tactics in Armenia. Alex, uh, latest reports say tense situation outside. Police station. Uh, Erevan. The Erevan police, police station. station. This was uh, starting to cascade uh, about uh, 48 hours ago, Alex. And uh, I haven't heard any reports after this. What's, what have you heard? Armenian news is very tricky to source properly. It's a very closed country and poor, but uh, having made many visits there, I'm trying to pick out what's going on. Essentially, um, I, I don't get lost in the detail here, the point is the West has tried for a long time to get an NGO-based color revolution uh, vibe uh, up and coming in Yerevan, and it's failed because the Armenians are far too well educated and self-respecting. Uh, and so the latest thing they've done is try to pick on the hot-headedness of soldiers who, are fe who fear that Azerbaijan was now is going to massively outgun them and try to take back Nagorno-Karabakh in this war that flared up again this spring that we talked about. So rather than directly assaulting Karabakh again, what these strategists seem to have done um, is got a hot-headed, maybe um, uh, imbalanced uh, ex-soldier to go and get some cronies and hold some parliamentarians hostage in a police station and behind this what you see is that the Armenian opposition is very disgruntled uh, because the guys who took the hostages in the police station are calling for the release of Jiraya this um, nationalist figure who quite correctly has said we are never going to give up land to Azerbaijan in return for peace and that's what's being expected of these Armenians it's a repeat of Northern Ireland and, and uh, Israel Palestine again give up land for peace well of course if you do that you get neither and you get bits uh, salami sliced off your country. Armenia already had so many salami slices taken that it's it's ended up you know smaller than Wales, hardly viable, and no no sea access. Uh, and this this is really what's being pushed on the Armenians. And of course, you're going to get some hot-headed people. They're very they're very calm, intellectual people. Some are going to do what this this uh, soldier did over the weekend and say, no, we're going to hold you hostage. But what's at the root of that as well is that he he and his cronies who've taken these hostages uh, have already set up an alternative structure to Parliament called the, the Foundational Forum or something. Different translations are available. So that makes me immediately think, ah, have we got some NGOs here working to give the idea that uh, you can forget national parliaments, the route to get what you want is by setting up alternative forums and getting social media coverage. So very, very interesting tactics being used. And, and never forget when you hear about these obscure Eastern countries, if it's pioneered there, it will be in America and Britain before you know it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And can, I, can I just interject there with a reminder, of course, that uh, UK Column um, has written articles exposing BBC's work in Kazakhstan in particular, where the BBC objective was to break down and change local communities, uh, local values, um, and replace it with the BBC approved values. So to get women's issues to the fore, to get the banking industry to the fore, to get credit cards to the fore. And um, BBC charity Media Action also boasting of its ability to operate in Syria in order to help members of the opposition destabilise the legitimate government. So BBC involved in this, and earlier on, Alex, you were intimating that we've got some dark actors behind the scenes from intelligence agencies at work. The evidence is gathering that we've got something beginning to operate beyond normal, legitimate political agendas here. Now, th th this is a normal practice for any revolution or any civil war, but the, the, the revolutionary uh, movement will, will take over, make a provisional government, will form it uh, even before the conflict is settled, take over civic life, start you know, picking up the garbage, making sure the water's running, the electricity. What, so what we're seeing is exactly that here, uh, Alex, if you agree with me, this is kind of a, all these countries that have achieved independence over the years, this is kind of a counter-revolutionary, NGO counter-revolutionary uh, uh, movement, uh, which is corporate uh, in a way, in its structure, and international in its scope. What, what, what do, you, do you agree with that? I think if you look at what happened in uh, 1917, 
to Russia, then that, that really is the, the foundation for all that you just discussed there, Pat, uh, because, of course, uh, you had two revolutions in Russia when they realized that they had no will to fight the First World War against the Germans anymore. The first was the February Revolution, or at least February in the, the old uh, Julian calendar they used then, March in our calendar, uh, and that brought, you know, the Westerners' dream to power, or at least the Western people's dream, you know, a, a liberal democracy, parliamentary-based idea. But Kerensky, who was in charge of that, rather interestingly called it the provisional government. Now, what did he know in, in spring of, of 1917? And provisional it very much turned out to be, because the Bolsheviks were, and this happens a lot in the Islamic world as well, as you say, they were feeding the kids and, and taking out the trash when no one else was. And by the um, autumn of that year, they were well enough armed, and we know now, thanks to the solid research of Anthony Sutton in several books, a Harvard professor who had to pay, for, pay with his job for it, we know from Sutton's books that it was Wall Street behind him all the way, and the Swiss as well, um, that the Bolsheviks were able then to muscle in in, in the, the, the later part of the year and say, well... Um, this, uh, this um, democracy lark is, is not what it's cracked up to be. Go with Bolshevism instead. So often the, um, the color revolution is just scene setting for uh, extreme nationalist uh, and religious tensions, which are then stoked after the, uh, the first collapse of the government to bring in a more um, you know, heavy handed regime later. So, so is, what are the danger of uh, now Gulen's in the spotlight? Uh, we have this uh, article here, Turkish Consul's Remarks. On Gulen affiliated schools stirs misunderstanding ahead of uh, the Prime Minister's Ankara, Ankara visit. So, uh, danger that this is spreading beyond Turkey? Are we looking at Georgia as well? This is right on Russia's doorstep. Uh, what's the significance quickly of this story? Yes. Uh, without getting into detail, um, it's the Turkish Consul General in Batumi on the Black Sea coast of Georgia, and that position uh, has always been an intelligence position. So the, the Turkish Consul General in Batumi is always an intelligence officer posing as a consul. So he's at the core of the Erdogan loyalists saying, we are Turkish intelligence, MIT is the name of the agency, uh, and we are realizing, although he's doing it as if he were a diplomat, we are realizing that these Gulenist schools are spreading color revolution ideas, and, and you Georgians are going to be very dissatisfied if you don't squash them now, uh, because you're going to realize that people's loyalties, especially Muslims in Georgia, are going to be turned against the government and against uh, lawful uh, representation in Parliament. So that, that he said that, and then immediately the Georgians have said, um, we think the consul's been misquoted in translation, at which point, of course, Georgian media then released the original audio of him speaking Turkish through his interpreter, and he's saying exactly what he was reported as saying, uh, the Gulen schools are a threat. So, uh, yes, neighbouring countries really are... You know, they're, they're not in the situation that Turkey is. Turkey is prosperous and middle class and, and doing better than Britain in its economy in many ways now. Uh, and so the people have now got invested in the government for the first time. That's why this is not a repeat of the 1960 coup in Turkey or the 1972 or the 1980, when the CIA could just tell the military, hey, um, uh, squash the government now uh, and return to the Western secularist fold. It doesn't work anymore because the Turkish middle class have got more uh, invested in the, the, their economy now than they ever did. They don't just want to be uh, fawning over Western tourists and selling cheap um, agricultural products. They actually want to be producing stuff, and they're doing it jolly well, and uh, you know, far better positioned in, in education and geography than we are to do that in the world economy. Uh, so that's what's changed. And the, the neighbors, the smaller countries like Georgia, are not in that position. So they are having to say rather nervously, oh, well, um, we can't really be uh, you know, as hot-headed as the Turks here. Uh, let's let's just uh, you know, try to study things. But what the Turks are seeing, even though, as I repeat, Erdogan is a very nasty piece of work, is uh, they're, they're, they're very uh, sharp in, the, in, the, in their sight here, and they're realizing that uh, Turkey is going to be destabilized and the whole region with it. Right. And, um, Alex, I was fascinated by this one, which uh, was talking about the Georgian uh, Prime Minister lecturing Britain. Um, it seems to me that there's more spin than you can get at in this article. So he's praising the European Union. He says that it's kept uh, peace and cooperation um, and there needs to be strong leadership. Uh, but um, for Britain, there's been Brexit. Respect it. Respect it and then deride the British in five further paragraphs because uh, the European Union is, is the best thing since sliced bread. Well, this prime minister is what the Western policymakers nowadays call a technocrat, a word invented in 1930s America uh, to mean somebody who hates religion and tradition and measures exactly how much money and, and energy every citizen is allowed to consume based on how good and loyal and, and productive they are. But this term technocrat has then been applied to these uh, periphery of Europe countries, North Africa, Caucasus and so on, as if it were a good term. And Kriyakashvili has only very recently come to power. The, the last Prime Minister, Garibashvili, unexpectedly resigned only a couple of years into his tenure. And so what you see is that these guys who've been educated in the West are parachuted in now and uh, rather shrilly are saying, um, 
you know, we, we can't upset the established order. George has been working towards the EU for 20 years, and we've always been told it's, it's uh, the bee's knees. How can the British leave? You see yes. what's going on there. So uh, these guys who owe nothing to their own country, really, and who, who have been trained abroad, are Trojan horses again, to use that term, in their own countries. Right. Now, this one uh, Breibart article is, uh, is fascinating because finally we've got the finger being pointed at Obama, that he's fostering a lawless society. In my opinion, that's exactly what he's doing. Uh, this is um, what the Alinsky agenda is about, breaking down America as a nation state, breaking down communities. Um, so we've got a uh, pastor here uh, pointing the finger and uh, that finger is, is pointed at President Obama. What a situation we've got where America is lecturing uh, other nation states on a world stage, Patrick, and then at home we're seeing breakdown. That's, that's how I view it. Well, th this has been the hallmark of this, this president ever, for, the, for two terms. He, every, at every opportunity, he's injected himself into any sort of racial incident or any sort of uh, uh, trial or Ferg Ferguson or Trayvon Martin or any of these stories he's, he's, and mass shootings. He's purposely injected himself and really played, absolutely played the race card, although he's not coming out and advertising. Yep. It's kind of obvious that's what he's doing. So, you know, the, the bottom line is Americans, it's, that isn't what America is, should be about. It, it shouldn't be taking side of one particular ethnic group, even if you feel that this is what, who you represent. Unless your objective is to create trouble and break down the structure, in and which it, case it makes total sense. It is, and, and he is leading a, an Alinsky kind of counter-revolution uh, of, in America, a very radical social agenda that's based on dividing and ruling, in my opinion. And on the right wing, they're doing exactly the same thing with the anti-Islam and uh, backing all of these sort of, what I think are many of them contrived events uh, to create a security he heightened hysteria about security and that we must intervene overseas. So on the left and the right, they're both playing their, their own side of this and trying to really crush the people in the middle uh, so that, that they love having people fighting against each other. Uh, street fights, and you're going to see more and more of this, uh, not just with the convention coming up in Cleveland, uh, right, right the way up to the November election. This is going to be one of the most dastardly, uh, staged, managed uh, wow. uh, COINTELPRO festivals right up until November. I absolutely see this. In fact, the upcoming episode of Insight will be talking about controlled opposition on the right and the left and COINTELPRO. Okay. So keep an eye out for that episode of Insight coming up in the, in the next week's uh, possibly in August. Okay, well, if we've got a breakdown of um, law and order in America, and I'm going to say a rather open and brash way, here in UK, things are done rather differently. Um, now, Alex, I've got an eye on the clock at the moment. We've got quite a bit uh, to cover. But of course, this is the way the British state operates. So we've got the Doherty family, uh, children taken away from them, no crime committed by the parents no accusations of neglect or harm to their children. All they have simply done is report criminal activity. And what does the state do? So we're talking here about Scotland and the Irish state, and of course, collusion by Theresa May, former Home Secretary. Um, we've now got a situation where the state in Western Europe, in UK, Scotland, Ireland, can simply take people's children. What's um, What's your latest uh, opinion on this, Alex? The latest thing I'm gleaning from reading the uh, in email queue, anyone who wishes to help, by the way, it's Doherty Investigation at UKcolumn.org, and that's D O C H Doherty. Doherty Investigation at UKcolumn.org. What we're finding reading the email queue there is that people are starting to realize that they're going to be in this for the long term. You know, it's not going to be a question of 100 people firing off one letter to uh, Chief Constable Gormley of Police Scotland or the Taoiseach in Ireland, it's going to take lots and lots and lots of persistence uh, and raising really the fear factor among these uh, officials who haven't done their jobs, that they're still being watched and it's not going to go away. And what you just showed on screen there with the Doherty files, 
despite the time, I'm just going to read it for 30 seconds, is this stroke of genius, and this illustrates where the, where the, uh, the investigation is evolving. So a very clever lady has written in saying that someone, and I'm going to put this out as a competition now, submit your scripts to Doherty Investigation at UKColumn.org. Somebody should write a morality play, play uh, in which um, a wolf in sheep's clothing, this is basically that the whole Doherty story is fiction, right? A wolf in sheep's clothing offers a fortune for a six-year-old boy. Polite Scotland, turn a blind eye and call on the help of the department of the Pied Piper of Hamlin to try and intern the boy and his three siblings. And then we've got the, the action moving from Aberdeenshire to Ireland, where the guardians of Ireland enter the fray and the threatening crashes and bumps increase. Can you believe that a puppy was hit and hurt with a taser gun and another dog stabbed? The plot gains momentum with many twists and turns and double dealing at the courts. The parents flee to a monastery in Northern Ireland and have to flee again after losing their children and all their possessions, clambering across fro frozen fields and scaling a castle wall to take a ferry back to the Kingdom of Scotland. Well, it's all true. That's, that's what happened in the Doherty case. Uh, and we can't get done if we put on medieval-style morality plays in which this happens, with Police Scotland having become Polite Scotland and the Garda becoming Guardians of Ireland. So points to remember are, please submit your ideas as well as your findings to Doherty Investigation at ukcolumn.org. And please remember that this is uh, going to be a long haul. Uh, it certainly is, and I'm going to say once again, because I believe it is totally true, that uh, whilst people... Of course, look at events in the um, Eastern, Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, events um, right up onto the Russian border. This makes people fearful. Uh, but the people who are going to do the damage to us are the people who will come knocking at our doors. We're talking about our police. We're talking about our security services. And of course, we're now talking about local authorities and mental health teams. So the threat the immediate threat to people in the UK at the moment, as we can clearly see by this and many other similar cases, is of course the British government is now operating outside the law. We're seeing it with Brexit as well, but the danger is the application of the local authorities to steal our children, take our houses, put us in prison. You've got some more things to say on, uh, on the coup in uh, Turkey, Patrick. Well, I just want to, to, we talk about the EU Army yeah. and uh, European military integration. We will talk more about that tomorrow yeah. uh, on your, your program, or at least you and Mike will. Um, but uh, this next story, I'm just going to note here, this backs up my, my theory that the, the U.S. is likely behind this failed coup. Uh, John Kerry threatened Turkey with its NATO membership yesterday. Okay, you can't get a bigger red flag than that after what happened over the weekend. And uh, also, interestingly, we go to the next story. Uh, it seems, it seems that uh, I was watching the coup live, and uh, RT's live stream went down globally. And it turns out there was a DDS attack, denial of service attack, uh, during the Turkish coup. I, I know that's a fact because I couldn't uh, get their live stream up um, in audio only for most of the night. So that's interesting. We're getting into the realm of some serious cyber warfare. And the next story is interesting too, WikiLeaks suffers a sustained attack after announcing a mega leak of a Turkish government documents. Now, this could very well be uh, you know, Washington dumping a bunch of documents on WikiLeaks, which they do from time to time. They use WikiLeaks to put out either information, disinformation, and large tranches of, uh, of data, which WikiLeaks will just put out. So I don't know if that's a genuine cyber attack there or if this is kind of a, fa a cyber false flag. But uh, we're getting into a stage, Brian, where this is going to become more regular. Media will be attacked. People, governments. Turbulence, uncertainty, fear. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to disorientate the public. Sure, and blocking key information at key times, uh, which is what happened. Now, this was a big story last night. Germany, uh, a, an axe murder, uh, apparently attacked and injured many people yesterday in, uh, in Germany, uh, not far from Nuremberg. This was a commuter train, uh, injured 20 people, a 17-year-old Afghan. Reportedly, he shouted, Allah Akbar. Uh, so immediately on the news wires, this was an ISIS attack. Okay, we look at this a little closer, and this is an exact repeat of, of this exact same attack on a commuter train, uh, which involved a knife in May, a uh, 27-year-old. Also, they called it an Allah Akbar attack. It turns out the police said they couldn't verify whether that was actually said. But it sounded good. It sounded good at the time. It reminds me of Britain First, uh, that, that whole talking point that came out Cox. with the Joe Cox murder. And as it cascades, it's just to show people this is what we have to deal with, Brian. 
in the wake of, that's why you shouldn't uh, fly off the handle with any one of these attacks and rush to judgment because most of the time, Brian, it turns out later that that's not what happened. Yeah. So we're meant to believe that a 17-year-old Afghan refugee to Germany was an ISIS fighter and this was in, somehow an ISIS-inspired attack. Um, he could just be a nutter on psychotropic drugs. He could be, who knows, ment really seriously mentally ill, paranoid schizophrenic, yeah. uh, medicated, who knows. But people go nuts a lot of the times. We don't know who's behind it, what's behind it. But is this an ISIS attack, really? So is the media going to go into hysterical mode every time anything happens involving yes, uh, a refugee? Yes, I think they are, because yeah. that's, that's the plan, isn't it, to get into people's minds. So we found a flag on this particular incident. Well, yeah, it's a it's apparently, quite... yeah, it's low budget now. Now it's a hand-painted ISIS flag. This is from the ISIS art department, uh, not to be confused with ISIS finger paintings. But uh, a handmade ISIS flag was found in his Bavarian... Uh, the room of the Bavarian 17-year-old Afghan. And ISIS is not big in Afghanistan, by the way. That's kind of Taliban country. But uh, that's beside the fact. Let's not let that get in the way of a good narrative. So interesting. ISIS flags are homemade. So this and brings us to our next story, Brian, uh, uh, on, the, on the Nice attacks. Um, this is an article that's up on 21st Century Wire. Uh, another known wolf spawned from Gladio's COINTELPRO litter. Uh, this is breaking down the Nice attacks in a way that I don't think anybody has yet. Uh, we show that th there was an actual police stand down order minutes before the truck drove through the crowd, Brian. Yeah. And this person was known by the French police, not just known, Brian, known very well by the French police, even though they're saying that he wasn't on the intelligence radar. That's not true. He was on their databases. He was definitely uh, at least special branch in Nice. Uh, we're very familiar with him. So in a state of emergency scenario where all the police and the gendarmerie and the intelligence service are all supposedly talking to each other, working together, and the army, or not. Yeah. Or not. Uh, so who is this attacker from Nice? This is broken down in this article. I do encourage people to go read it. You'll get answers. Right. And you, of course, mentioning Gladio as well. Alex has mentioned the same thing. So the undertone is that these are constructive events in order to create fear and chaos in a nation state. And this is nothing new, Brian. This is a practice that's very, very well developed in Europe and in North America and in South America and many places around the world for the, yeah. for the best, better part of the last half century. Mm -hmm. So this is not a surprise to anybody. So this brings us to this one. This is uh, Mr. Tom Watson and Mr. David Davis. So bulk data collection is only lawful in serious crime cases. This is a, a recent ruling by the ECJ. So European court ruling backs David Davis and Tom Watson and could have serious impact on so-called so-called Snoopers Charter. So is this a case of these two gentlemen are champions of the people's rights or are we just dancing around in circles here with regards to the Snoopers Charter, Brian? This is my question. Circles, I believe. Okay, well, just um, very, very quickly on these two and then we can just move on to... Uh... Chilcot, which I think is an important thing for us to cover. Okay, quickly, uh, in the U.S., the uh, Republican convention's coming up. It's about to ex ignite uh, right now in Cleveland. Uh, the, the Trump's backers are definitely playing the fear card, uh, especially in the aftermath of Dallas and another so-called copycat police shooting in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, only two, a day and a half ago. And uh, so that's happening. No surprise there. But what's really interesting is the next uh, story that we have uh, this is Donald Trump's uh, supermodel wife, uh, potential first lady Melania Trump. Uh, she's been accused of plagiarizing Michelle Obama's uh, speech uh, from 2008. So this is interesting. Uh, as if Melania Trump would be outsourcing her own speech. I don't think so. That was done by an aide in the campaign. My guess, Brian, is there's a viper in the Trump nest. And they've handed Melania, there you go, darling. Donald probably read it over. He hasn't read Michelle Obama's speech in 2008. And she's just taken it. And she's taken it, and she went, and then they've, the knife came in immediately. So this is what's up. It's a high-stakes game in America in terms of politics. Dirty tricks uh, everywhere. Yeah. So something we're going to get used to, I think, in the next four months. Okay. Well, we have just um, put up a quick advert for our um, uh, UK column meeting, which is uh, tomorrow night at uh, the George in Plimpton. Anybody welcome to come along? And also, we're taking pre-orders for a new UK column 
design t-shirt so if you haven't yet got one of those and you'd like to support what we're doing uh, please consider putting in an order well let's just finish off here with a little look at um uh well a little look at mr chilcott and where that leads us so the daily mail here uh, is basically saying that uh, the families are now so disgusted with no action uh, they're setting up crowdfunding to take tony blair to <laughs> court crowd justice i i find that a very interesting term because lynch mob comes to me so are people being played here i don't know but of course the grief of the families is real uh well what about this for a picture in the article and here's tony blair he's he's been getting an award we'll come on to that in a minute um but um this is uh, what he said on one of on one of his organizations i do a lot of work in a lot of african countries something's just direct it's immediate it's simple it's scalable and there are large numbers of people who are benefiting from it he's quite a man uh, we could put that in a different language he did a lot of work in iraq and hundreds of thousands died but at the moment um, he's getting an award from this organization uh, starkey they help people with hearing difficulties but i was a little suspicious to see that they've signed into the 2010 clinton global initiative so I wonder whether there's something a little bit devious. We're into helping people who need help, but uh, we're drifting in a little bit of a political globalist agenda on the back of it. Sure. Well, um, the article mentions that uh, um, Tony Blair is involved with the Africa Governance Initiative, and I really encourage people to go and have a look at this website. This is uh, one of the opening pages. And what sort of thing is he doing? Well, he's uniting all of these. Uh, African countries. He's put Africa on the G8 agenda. He's established the Commission for Africa. He's established the African Governance Initiative. And uh, he's supporting presidents and other leaders to take on the challenge of reform and reducing poverty. All the things that he achieved in the Middle East, he's um, going to give to the Africans for free. What's, what's interesting, I'll, to interrupt you, Brian, all of those things on that bullet point list right there on screen, Muammar Gaddafi was championing and pushing forward before he was, his country was destroyed and he was dragged through the streets yeah. by NATO-backed. After getting a handshake from Tony Blair, of course, in after, that famous picture. After getting the, the, the handshake of death from right. Tony Blair. Isn't that, isn't that extraordinary? It's an amazing coincidence, and we'll go deeper into that one. Uh, what can we see happening? Tony Blair is spreading the globalist agenda, which, of course, is to unite uh, Africa in one nation state. Uh, but we should trust him. Um, on the uh, AGI website, it says this. It talks about the government LED. It says it's focused on impact. It's independent, of course, never... Uh, I never doubt that it's an independent organization. It's bold, it's passionate, and it's politically savvy. And you have the childish, childlike icons as well. This is a standard feature here. Agenda 2030, even Agenda 21. You have to have these restroom signs, uh, logos. For children. For all the initiatives and all the uh, stuff. Yeah, it's very, very colorful, very oh, nice. Cartoon-like, yeah. totally agree. Uh, well, behind the scenes, we come to this man, very interesting, Nick Thompson. He's the CEO of Africa Governance Initiative. Effective government will determine which African countries leap forward, improving millions of lives. That's why I'm passionate about our work. Uh, well, who is this man? He's former UK civil servant, uh, was ministerial advisor for energy, climate change and the European Union. So a lot of experience on Africa, of course. And um, he was working with the Department of Business and the Cabinet Office, Ofgem, uh, et cetera. Who is he? We still don't know. Uh, but if we come in a different direction, uh, here he is receiving an award for his uh, work on Ebola. An Ebola award. And uh, by some of his tweets, we find that he's very big on um, globalist agenda. Here's the world government scene being pushed forward in cartoon form. Yes. Or if that's not enough, just have a look at the left of your screen. It says um, we've got agents with uh, heterogeneous perspectives and heuristics. Problem solving, I believe that is. Um, emergence through interaction gets you to the global system. And he said good governance means transparency and accountability. Yeah. Uh, I wish we had that with Tony Blair. 
in Chilcot. Yes. Apparently we didn't. Well, good you've mentioned that because um, here is Mr. Blair after Chilcot, of course. Uh, we've got lots of angry families. They want something to happen. And Mr. Chilcot standing up and he said some interesting things about whether the military action was legal. He said that basically that hadn't been achieved. The inquiry has not expressed a view on whether military action was legal. That could, of course, only been resolved by a properly constituted an internationally recognised court. So if we follow through, uh, Mr Blair lied or deceived Parliament over the weapons of mass destruction. So therefore, Parliament's decision for war was based on fraud. Uh, in a uh, legal case, once fraud is identified, everything that follows is also fraudulent. That's the legal precedence. Thus, the decision for war was fraudulent. Uh, but Chilcot is now suggesting that the UK no longer has its own system of law capable of trying, try the, got to repeat there, of trying politicians. Is, is it not that it, has, it doesn't have its system, Brian, or it doesn't have the will to enact? No, he's saying it hasn't got the system it hasn't because got he the said system. it's got to be an internationally recognised system in order to take Tony Blair. So here we have, so we have Chilcot. No, we have no impeachment process. We, we have, have no, no system courts, of law. We have no laws. Is, yep. that, is, that, is that true? Alex, 20 seconds. It's not true, but fortunately, uh, Blair could be arrested thanks to his own actions still. Let me explain in 20 seconds. In Blair's first term, the Rome Statute set up the International Criminal Court and Blair... Uh, whipped his MPs to vote through the uh, UK's International Criminal Court Act, well, one for England and Wales and one for Scotland. So that means that if and when the prosecutor at the ICC in The Hague, currently a Gambian lady who's very keen to prove that unlike her predecessors, she doesn't just try black people, she wants to try some white people, and she's already going for Saakashvili of Georgia, uh, if she issues <clears throat> the summons to Blair, uh, any British constabulary, uh, wherever Blair is at that moment, is obliged by our own act to deliver him to The Hague. And there's one more thing about that. People think the International Criminal Court in The Hague only has three mandates, the famous ones of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. But subsequently, the Rome Statute added a fourth competence to the ICC, which is for trying people for the crime of aggression. Right? And the prosecutor, before Chilcot came out, responded to a Daily Telegraph uh, um, article by saying, the Telegraph is wrong, I have not closed the file on Blair, I can still get him if I, if I think the grounds are there under the crime of aggression mandate, which has been given to me subsequently. So there is every chance that even if we don't think we have the means to try and impeach Blair, that our own politicians will be flying him over to The Hague. Alex? Thank you very much for summing that up for us. Uh, we're just about on the hour. It's now very hot in the studio, so we <laughs> must follow government advice and seek somewhere cooler, have a drink uh, of water. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to all our viewers and listeners for joining us. Alex, thank you. Patrick, thank you. If you like what we do, please consider taking out a subscription or making a donation. UK Column can only do what it does with your help. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.